Last week, I referred to Ecclesiastes 8, 4, where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? A true king's word is absolute. And, excuse me, I began with a quotation from the late atheist Christopher Hitchens um, about how the, the beauty and the grace of the King James Bible had comforted him at the loss of his father when he was a teenager. Today I want to continue with uh, a King James Sermon, Part 2. I got some very nice comments from some people who watched it on YouTube, and one of the, there's a couple of nuts in there too, uh, it's talking about things that are completely unrelated. But there was a, one nice comment and a, a lady asked if we'd have a Part 2. And so I had a lot of material left over from last week, which we didn't use, and so uh, yes, today will be part two of that sermon. And I'm going to begin with a quote from his younger brother, Peter Hitchens. He also was an atheist and a member of the uh, Socialist Party in Great Britain. Uh, so was his wife-to-be when they were both young. But he writes about his eventual conversion to Christ in a 2010 book called The Rage Against God. And let me read to you directly from his words. He's become a very sought after uh, conservative commentator in the United Kingdom and a great exponent of the King James Bible. But he says, the swearing of, now, let me back up. When he gave his life to Christ, because the Anglican Church gave the world the King James Bible, I think that might have had something to do with him and his wife returning to the Anglican Church where they were both raised as little children. And um, we don't fully understand how people could get much substance, spiritual substance out of that. Dr. Ruckman used to refer to uh, the Church of England as simply Roman Catholics who flunked their Latin. And uh, for us Baptists, the Anglican Church is not our cup of tea, pun intended, but be that as it is, um, he writes about the christening ceremonies that he and his wife were obliged to uh, observe. And he says on page 106 of his book, the swearing of great oaths concentrates the mind. So did the baptisms first of my daughter and then of my wife, who, raised as a Marxist atheist, trod another rather different path to the same place. Her christening followed a particularly lovely and robust form devised in the 17th century England. I remember the rather reasonable answer the candidate is asked to give in reply to the enormous question, wilt thou then obediently keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in the same all the days of thy life? The required response is, I will endeavor so to do, God being my helper, which seems to me to be a realistic promise. My own confirmation, by contrast, was a miserable modern language affair with all the poetic force of a driving test and endured by me in much the same spirit. But. Charles Harrington Elster is a Yale graduate who created the Verbal Advantage um, vocabulary program, and he's written several books on vocabulary building, books um, intended to help students prepare for the SAT uh, or for just general language improvement by anyone interested. And in his books, he introduces the, the reader to a whole uh, array of great words drawn right out of our King James Bible, but words which many of, many of us never think to, to employ in our conversation. And, uh, and I was very impressed to discover that. So I, I found him on the internet and I emailed him several months ago and I thanked him for including 
uh, so many wonderful words from the King James Bible in his material. And I then asked if he could comment on the, the influence the King James Bible had had on the development of the English language. And let me read to you part of his uh, reply. Thanks so much for writing and sharing your comments and kind words. In my junior year of high school, my amazing English teacher had us read a great deal of the King James Bible and even had us memorize and recite the final chapter of Ecclesiastes, Remember Now Thy Creator, and so forth. From that and my own study of it, I developed a great love and respect for the King James and a marked disdain for all the other modern versions, whose language to me seems pedestrian. And pedestrian means it's, it's unoriginal. It, it lacks any sort of vitality or life. You'll have to consult a different sort of scholar for a definitive opinion on how the authorized version has influenced the language. One other thing I think you'll appreciate, whenever I recite the Lord's Prayer, I make a point of using the relative pronoun, which, as it is rendered in the archaic English of King James, our Father, which art in heaven. How many people out there know that's the way it was originally, and as my father liked to say, how it's supposed to be. Good words to you, Charles Harrington Elster. I, I appreciated getting that letter from him. There's a story about uh, a town in Arizona and um, back in the old days of the Old West and one cowboy says to another, um, I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat upon him was death and hell followed him from Revelation 6, verse 8, King James Version. You know what that incident was? That was from a scene in the 1993 movie, Tombstone. Now, there's only one Bible that Hollywood knows anything about. You'll notice that the language of the King James Bible, and by the way, if, just as an aside, if you're trying to take notes, don't worry about it. This isn't outlined very well. I'm just going to give you a lot of uh, observations and some quotations. I just want you to listen for today. You'll notice that the language of the King James Bible is precise. When the Bible addresses an individual, it reads, Thee, thou, thy, and thine, the possessive. It's, if addressing more than one person, it says, Ye, you, and your. The modern versions simply say, you, 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 everywhere. And um, they're not nearly as careful and as exacting. The Bible is not only precise, but it's concise. It uses as few words as necessary to convey its point. It may be um, a brief in its form, but it's very comprehensive in its content and in its scope, for example, in William Tyndale's Bible before the King James Version, it says in 1 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 6, Godliness is great riches if a man be content with that he hath. The King James translators tighten that up to read, Godliness with contentment is great gain. And uh, making it more easy to uh, memorize and commit to memory. Yet the expressions throughout the King James, um, th rather, there are some who advocate for the new versions that maintain that King James language is too high and uh, flowery. It's too um, formal, too exalted for the modern reader. But in 1611, the expressions found in the King James Bible were understood by everybody. That was the language of the common man for all practical purpose. The Bible is not too difficult. People are too stupid. And people are not only stupid, but they're lazy. Go get a dictionary and see what the word means if you find a challenging word that you, you're not quite familiar with. There was a fierce battle in World War II, and there was an army sniper who took comfort in the following words. Blessed be the Lord, my strength, 
which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. Psalm 144, verses 1 and 2, King James Version. That was from the 1998 movie, Saving Private Ryan. There's only one Bible Hollywood knows anything about. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7 tell us, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. After 1611, when anyone in the English-speaking world referred to the Bible, this is the Bible they meant. This is what they were talking about. They weren't referring to dusty uh, manuscripts of Hebrew and Greek or Aramaic or even Latin uh, when they refer to the Bible. They meant the book they held in their hands. But the last 50 to 60 years have seen a continual campaign uh, to, to usurp uh, the authority of the King James Bible and, and to detract from its um, influence. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Psalm 19, verse 7. That's a, that's a, that should be a comforting uh, assertion and a comforting promise to anyone reading the Bible when you open it up. To know that it's perfect and that what it says is sure. You can depend upon it. You can draw strength from it. The NIV translators, 1978, said this in their preface. Like all translations made as they are by imperfect men, this one undoubtedly falls short of its goals. Well, if it fell short of its goals, why'd you put it on the market? Let's try to sell it anyway. And the reason, rather the only reason any publishing company would dare to write such words about their product is they want to condition you, the buyer, to get ready for the next revised, updated, expanded, improved, new and improved version that's undoubtedly going to come. And they've updated the NIV about twice since 1978. Sixty years ago, virtually all Protestant denominations, all Protestant groups, preached and taught from the King James Bible. To them, that was the Word of God. And it was possible to have uh, citywide campaigns or, or, or rallies. Think of Billy Graham's earliest days back in the 50s, his earliest uh, revivals in which multiple denominations could support what he was preaching because they were all preaching it in largely the same way from the same book. But one by one, those denominations began to adopt uh, modern versions, thinking that they would convey the, the gospel more effectively, uh, especially to the young, but it didn't all turn out as they had planned. I can, I could drive you around this area, and Brother Carl and I have talked about this, and I could take you to former uh, Methodist churches, Episcopalian churches, Baptist churches, Pentecostal churches, Presbyterian churches that are all now Buddhist temples. And I guarantee you every single one of those former churches had adopted some modern Bible, thinking that this was going to solve their problems. Uh, yet those of us who still believe that the King James Bible is the perfect word of God are branded as heretics, the King James only cult, as we're often called. Well, if believing, how is it that someone who professes to be saved, who professes to be born again, and knows Jesus Christ as their Savior, accuses another Christian of belonging to some cult because that other Christian says, the Bible I hold in my hands is the word of God? How do we get to that point? 
those of us who believe that that Bible is still the perfect word of God, we think all of them are the heretics. They forsook the Bible God had put in their hands. And for us, that's the, that Bible is the Bible, and it will always be the Bible. It's the definitive word of God to a lost world. There was a crime drama, and a guy is about to gun down his boss's enemy, and he cites these verses from Ezekiel 25, verse 17. Or this verse, And I will execute great vengeance upon them, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. That's from Samuel L. Jackson's character in the 1994 movie Pulp Fiction. I didn't see those movies either, by the way. I'm just using them as illustrations. There's only one Bible Hollywood knows anything about. The next time you visit a Barnes & Noble bookstore or even the public library, pay attention to all the books on various topics that incorporate the word Bible in their titles. Let me give you a brief list. This is just a partial list. All of these I have seen and took pictures of on my cell phone, so they're all on my cell phone. That's how I was able to re re recall them today. There's the Sales Bible. That's on business marketing. The Flavor Bible. That's uh, cooking with spices. The Saltwater Fisherman's Bible. That's self-explanatory. The Cookie Bible. That's a very tasty version. The College Career Bible. There's the Back Bible, if your back is hurting and sore. The Pasta Bible. The Chakra Bible. Those are the pressure points in Asian medicine. The Crystal Bible, if you collect rocks and gemstones. The Crystal Bible too. I guess that was the updated version, um, which includes um, New Age healing properties of rocks. By the way, how in the world would that work? How does a rock cure you? Uh, you know, the Shooter's Bible, that's about rifles and firearms. The Food Bible, that's a, just about healthy cooking. The Angel Bible, which the subtitle claims to be the definitive guide to angel wisdom. How they researched and accumulated all that wisdom, I have no idea. There's the wine Bible, that's for drunkards. <laughs> the juicing Bible, that's more health food advice. The, the memory Bible, do you forget things? The allergy Bible, the One Dish Bible, that's for simple cooking. The Boating Bible. The Cake Bible, that was a very yummy translation. The Runner's Bible, if you don't know how to run. There's the Mosaic Artist's Bible, that's on decor and interior design. The Golf Geek's Bible. The Irish cooking Bible, the prosperity Bible. Believe it or not, that wasn't by a charismatic. That was actually written about money uh, management and investments. The prosperity Bible, the travel detective Bible. That's about tourism. The franchise Bible, how to be your own boss. The juice and fasting Bible, more health food uh, gibberish. The Reiki healing Bible, that's more new age healing. The Yoga Healing Bible. The RV Owner's Bible. The Beauty and Makeup Bible. The Skin Divers Bible. The Baking Bible, not to be confused with the Cake Bible. The Vegan Bible. The Grilling Bible, now we're talking. <laughs> the Guitar Chord Bible. The Job Seekers Bible, if you're unemployed. The Parenting Bible. The Baby Name Bible. 
the smoothies Bible, the more health food uh, uh, advice, the side effects Bible, it's on drug and medication interactions, the crochet and stitching Bible, the diabetic Bible, the soup Bible, the gluten-free Bible, the 1,000 Cooks Bible, that's another book of recipes, the Vegetarian Bible, not to be confused with the Vegan Bible, the Blender Bible, the Low Carb Bible, the Consumer's Bible, the Cocktail Bible, and the Triathlete's Training Bible. There is also the Wiccan Bible on modern day witchcraft, the Buddhist Bible, and even the Atheist Bible. All of those are books for sale. Just to name a few, those are just the ones I happen to notice as I'm walking through the aisle of a store. But each of those books, uh, using the word Bible, claims to be the final word, the final authority on that given subject. And that's the authority of the word Bible inspired by the King James Version. The authority that is attached to the word Bible didn't come from the Living Bible of Kenneth Taylor or the New American Standard Version. Now, let me read from a tract I wrote back in 1994 called uh, What Others Are Saying About the King James Version. Here's what some modern translations have said about the King James Bible of 1611. The style of the 1611 English version has been creative as well as a creation. It has entered into the literature and language of the English-speaking race. To them, this version brought what they understood to be the direct words of God. The direct words of God. That's from the preface to the James Moffat translation, 1952. The King James Version has, with good reason, been termed the noblest monument of English prose. It entered, as no other book has, into the making of the personal character and the public institutions of the English-speaking peoples. We owe to it an incalculable debt. That's from the preface to the Revised Standard Version, 1952. The most important document in the history of the English language is the King James Version of the Bible. To measure its spiritual impact on the English-speaking world would be more impossible than counting the grains of sand along the ocean shores. That's from the preface to the Contemporary English Version, 1995. We are hardly, we are, we are it is hardly needful to say deeply grateful for the works of our non-Jewish predecessors, such as the authorized version with its admirable diction, which can never be surpassed. That's from the Jewish Publication Society's Scriptures for Synagogue, published in 1917. But of course, they're going to go ahead and offer their version of it anyway, right? Uh, it's often been asked, is the King James Bible accurate to ancient texts? The King James 1611 translators were committed to producing an English Bible that would be a precise translation and by no means a paraphrase or a broadly approximate rendering. The scholars were fully familiar with the original languages of the Bible. Their reverence for the divine author and his word assured a translation of the scriptures in which only a principle of utmost accuracy could be accepted. That's from the preface to the new King James Version, 1982. What a, that's quite different from what the NIV said about admitting that their Bible fell short of its goals, right? Isn't the old English difficult to understand? Sometimes the modern versions are even worse. Genesis 6, verse 4, the King James Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days. All of the modern versions say the Nephilim were there. 
what in the world are they? (laughs) Numbers 21, verse 14 says in the King James Bible, what he did in the Red Sea and the rivers of Arnon. Modern versions say, Waheb in the Supfa and in the rivers of Arnon. What in the world is that? Are they talking in tongues? The list could go on. The King James Bible uses the word butter in one or two verses in the Old Testament. The modern translations convert that to curds. If I sent one of you kids down to the market, down to Stater Brothers, and asked you to get a, a package of butter, You'd know what I meant, but if I said, go down to the Seder Brothers and pick up some curds and bring it home, you'd have no idea what that meant. You know, they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. The Revised Standard Version Bible seeks to preserve all that is best in the English Bible as it has been known and to stand in the great Tyndale King James tradition. That's from the Revised Standard Version. We have tried to put the message of the scriptures in simple, enduring words and expressions that are worthy to stand in the great tradition of the King James Bible. That's the preface to the new Revised Standard Version, 1989. As for other proper nouns, the familiar spellings of the King James Version are generally retained. That's the preface to the New International Version, 1978. The chapter and verse numberings follow that of the King James Version, thus making possible easy comparison. That's from the JW uh, New World Translation, 1950. Lastly, back in 1965, after seeing a lot of the silliness surrounding the holiday, a little boy asked, Isn't there anyone who knows the true meaning of Christmas? And his friend said, he, I can tell you what it is. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. God only knows how awful that movie would have been had they quoted from some modern translation. They had quoted from Eugene Peterson's Paraphrase the message. There were sheep herders camping in the neighborhood. What kind of crap is that? Or the New Living Translation. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. What sort of crap is that? Words cannot express how profound the King James Bible is and has been on the institutions of the English-speaking world, monuments, engravings on, the, on public buildings. The United Nations has a plaque from the book of Isaiah, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore, right into the King James text. It's often been said that the King James Bible is the greatest work of art ever created by a committee rather than an individual. And uh, let me close with this thought. 
in the end of that tract, and I had in mind uh, offering these for free, put a little display rack or holder in the section of these bookstores that have Bibles, where they have all these multiple versions, just have that available for information's sake to the p prospective buyer. Where the word of a king is, there is power, King James Bible says, if even the modern versions praise the King James Version, shouldn't you be reading it too? 